Hello, and welcome to another episode of Be Kind Connects. I'm your host, Shabnam Islam. And today we have, in my opinion, one of the world's most progressive climate solution strategists, Dr. Silesh Rowe. Now, Dr. Silesh Rowe is the founder and executive director of Climate Healers, a nonprofit dedicated towards healing the Earth's climate. And Dr. Rowe is a trained system specialist with a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. However, you may know Dr. Rao as his work as an executive producer from some of the most thought-provoking documentaries out there, including The Human Experiment, Cowspiracy, What the Health, A Prayer for Compassion, They're Trying to Kill Us, and most recently, the 2021 documentary, Milked. And let's not forget to mention, he is the author of two books that should be on your must read now reading list. And they are Carbon Dharma, The Occupation of Butterflies, and Carbon Yoga, The Vegan Metamorphosis. Dr. Rao, it is, a, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on our show. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to jump right into this. I, I think a lot of people know about your former work as a system specialist in the 90s. You were instrumental in the development of creating standard operate, standard practices and connecting solutions to the internet before the internet, what it was today, right? And most importantly, the discoveries and solutions that you and your team made uh, accelerated the growth of the internet, but the information developed had to be given away as a public service. Can you tell us how this work has influenced the work you're doing today? Oh, it's influenced me so greatly because when I started working on the internet back in the 90s, um, it was it was actually clunky. You know, I used to have an internet connection in my in my office, and it was uh, a cable, and you had to tap into it, and depending on the time of the day, you had to move your computer, otherwise it wouldn't work. <laughs> So that was the kind of things we, we had to put up with, right? And then um, uh, 10 base T came along, which was 10 megabit per second on twisted pair. And it took off, actually. That's how the internet started uh, started becoming more and more widely available because it made it easy for people to connect. You didn't have to have a PhD to figure out where to put things in and how to, how, how to connect. So... Uh, that was the beginning. And then we they increased it to 100 megabits, so 10 times faster. And then they were running into problems with getting 100 megabit to work properly okay, uh, on that cable. And that's when I came in and I, they asked me to look at it as a systems engineer. Tell us how, what we should be doing differently. And I took a look at the cable and the uh, specification and I said, actually, I can do 1,000 megabits on this. It's so It's easy to do 1,000 megabits on this. And so I was so excited. I went and made that presentation uh, to the IEEE, the, Inter the Institute for Electrical Engineering and Electronic Engineers. And they all laughed at me. <laughs> they said, we are having trouble getting 100 to work and you're talking about doing 1,000. You're crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they said, we'll believe it when we see it. But it was an open source platform, you know, the, the standards body is it it an open source. Anyone can come in and participate in it. You just had to know, you know, what you were doing and people will listen to you. So, and we were giving it away, literally. The standards were created and given away so that people can go and create things with it. It was really interoperability standards. And so they let me play. They said, if you think it can be done, go play, figure it out, right? They let me play. And that was the greatest gift I got in, as an engineer. Because uh, by the end of that year, 96 November, there were more people you know, working on 1,000 megabits than on other, other aspects of it. And so they knew that it was serious. The people were beginning to see it can be done. Right. There was some substance to what I was saying. And the company got acquired. My company got acquired. And suddenly I had resources to help me build this. And, and then my, that company got acquired. The, the company that, that acquired my company was Level One Communications. And that got acquired by Intel in 1999 oh, wow. for $2 billion, oh, $2.2 billion. <laughs> and wow. suddenly I had the might of Intel behind this, right? Mm -hmm. And we got it on the motherboard by 2003. And the internet just took off. It was on every motherboard at Intel in 2003. And uh, uh, and then the same people who told me it couldn't be done 
uh, they came and said, you know, it's actually more robust doing a thousand than it is to do a hundred. So there are cables <laughs> in our lab. We should work at a thousand, but it doesn't work at a hundred. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That's fantastic. So it's just how do you specify things and how do you use use the resources that are available to you? So when I started working on the environment, I saw the exact same situation happening here. So there is so much waste in the way we do things that there is actually tremendous abundance available to us that we are not using properly. And so I see the transformation to a vegan world as a way to tap into that abundance and to, to not be in the same mindset of scarcity that we are in at the moment. Yes, which is absolutely. Not the old model. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and your mission to get to a vegan world by 2026 started off with a bedtime story and a pinky promise to your granddaughter. And I absolutely love that story. But what I what really struck out to me is when you were speaking at the first annual vegan spirituality forum and retreat, you used the analogy from a cocoon to the butterfly. And you really use this to discuss the transformation of the world into a vegan world. Can you explain that further in detail? Yeah. Um, see, we are part of a larger ecosystem that has tremendous intelligence that we don't see directly. Okay. But if you go look at an ecosystem, a thriving ecosystem, you will see this intelligence at play. You will see every animal doing its part and the ecosystem thrives. So every part of nature contributes to the flourishing of nature, okay? But it also takes from nature. But every part of nature tends to contribute more than it takes. Mm -hmm. And this is why nature flourishes in a, in a pristine ecosystem. Right now, we are the only species that seems like we take more than we contribute. Yes. Okay? So, so we are in this phase where we are taking more than we contribute. And in the process, we have sort of looks like we are destroying the planet. But in reality, what we have done is we have heated up the planet. We've heated up the planet so that the planet can never, ever go back to another ice age again, as long as we are around. Okay? So we have done our part at heating up the planet and understanding our own strengths. And that is the caterpillar phase of humanity. So I say then that COVID-19, you know, is like it, it has put us in the chrysalis phase and the, in the, and the development of the internet and all these documentaries. It's sort of, it's an awakening that's happening so that we now understand our strengths. And when you're strong, you can either be a bully or you can be a protective caretaker. Mm, so it's powerful. a choice we have in front of us. What do you want to do? But if you continue to be bullies, nature is going to bully us even more. <laughs> Nature always amplifies what you do to her, right? Absolutely. And I, I was reading you had in your climate position, your, you d in a climate healer's position paper, you co-authored the en engineer solution to scientists warnings. Mm. You opened up with a statistic uh, provided by the World Wildlife Fund's 2016 Living Planet Report, which reported that between 1970 and 2016, that the, the total biomass of wildlife vertebrates had declined by 68%. That's right. in less than 50 years. Uh, and this gets you talking about this thing called the global ecological Ponzi scheme, right? Can you, can you talk to us further about like the false axiom of consumerism and the burning machine and the false axiom of suprem supremacism and the killing machine? <laughs> There's a lot packed in that question. I know, no, I no. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, yeah, we are in a, uh, we, we have been heating up the planet by running a global ecological Ponzi scheme. Okay? So that's what that is. It's a Ponzi scheme. So we extract from nature and we extract from the poor. And as we as the uh, products funnel up to the top, we siphon off the wealth. Okay? So that's so it's like everyone is sitting on this pyramid and figuring out how to suck out of this flow that goes up, right? So. Uh, I did a, a, you know, you, you can you can actually go check this out too. You can go buy a pound of rice in the supermarket, organic rice, say, say it costs $2. And you can go and ask the woman in uh, India or Bangladesh who grew that rice. And you'll see that she gets paid around 5 cents. 
Okay, so she did almost everything. She she worked to till the rice fields. She grew the rice. She actually even paid for the for the machine operator who was milling it. You know, to so take all the husks off. So it's the finished product that she's selling. So it's the traders that then siphon off the rest. Okay, so it's like a reverse Robin Hood scheme that we have created. Yeah, to extract from the poor to enrich the wealthy. And so I say that now we have to look at all the money that we have accumulated as some something that we are holding in trust for that woman. And what are we going to do now to help that woman and to help the animals who who are actually working for free, right? So they're, they've been giving us their, their labor and their bodies um, pretty much to support our economy, right? And for free. So how do we use this wealth that we have accumulated to free them? Because ultimately it's about freedom, you know? Uh, an ecosystem that thrives is it's an ecosystem in which every being is free to, to play their part. And so so that's our uh, our role now. You know, how do you figure figure out this transformation? Going from the caterpillar to the butterfly. And so these two machines that I, that you mentioned, the killing machine and the burning machine, uh, this is how we have been running this ecological Ponzi scheme. And the burning machine is what everyone seems to focus on. And that's what our media wants us to focus on because they're trying to f- preserve the system. You know, so to preserve the system, they have to kind of tell a story where it is not the two machines that are the problem. It's the fuel for the machine mm-hmm. that's the mm-hmm. problem. Mm-hmm. So you can still continue the machines, but you just have to change the fuel from fossil fuels to clean energy. And then you can continue running the machines, which is absolutely false. The killing machine is going to kill us, as you pointed out from the statistic. Mm-hmm. 68% of wild animals died between 1970 and 2016, and it was only 52% by 2010. So it increased by 16% in, what, six years? So at that rate, we are on track to wipe out 100% of wild animals by 2026. This is why we are running the Vegan World 2026 project. We have no choice but to get to a vegan world by 2026. And that's the ultimate choice that you have to offer the world and we need to educate them on. Do you choose to either continue to live this life or go vegan Um, Mm -hmm. because it has that impact? Now, what specific strategic actions do you need to be taken to bring us back to this thermostat setting scenario versus the mm-hmm. near-term extension scenario that you just discussed? Yeah, the so the seven strategic actions that we have detailed in our systems, I mean, the, the engineering solutions paper. Um, the seven strategic actions are first, education, education, education. We have to, we have to tell the story over and over, simpler and simpler terms so that people understand you're being duped into consuming these bad products so that you get sick and that you become a customer for the pharmaceutical industry. So we are all being duped in many, many ways. You know, so Dr. McDougall in his new website, the McDougallFoundation.org has the four deadly dietary deceptions, you know, and the protein deception, the calcium deception, the omega-3 fat deception, and the carb deception. These are deceptions, and we we have those deceptions in our textbooks, in our children's textbooks, and in our medical textbooks. They don't teach you. I'm a right? professor of kinesiology at Cal State Northridge, and you know when we discuss nutrition and dietetics, we ver- I very much have to outsource other literature resources. I make them watch the Game Changers. Now I might have to add one of these "What the Health" in there as well, right? Um, but it, they they need to be exposed to something else other than uh, but I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> yeah, standard... you started, you started with number one, education. So. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's, yeah. To me, that's important. The most important thing that we should be doing now. And the second is, uh, I say that we need to get the UN and the institutions to understand that we know what they're up to. And so, uh, so that, uh, I, I'm saying that if you ask the UN to drop goal number eight in its sustainable development goals, 
Goal number eight is economic growth. And growth is necessary for a Ponzi scheme to continue. Absolutely. Okay. So we have to tell them, drop that goal number eight and stop pretending that you're addressing all the goals by just focusing on economic growth because it's not going to do it. We know that. And then add goal number 18, which is what Claire Smith calls. Claire Smith is the one who came up with that. And that is zero animal exploitation. Mm. Yes. So if you add that as a goal, then you will notice that every other goal becomes easy to meet. Because in, in a vegan world, it's easy to have good health and well-being. It's easy to have zero hunger. It is easy to have no poverty. So all the other goals become easy to meet. Okay? So, um, so we need to, uh, I'm saying we need to petition the UN to drop goal number eight and add goal number 18 as a campaign, as part of the education. Too. And as, as a part of telling the UN and other institutions that we know what they're up to and they, they can stop now pretending. Yes. Yes. Right. And, and so the third is what I call the food healers initiative, which is make healthy vegan food easily available to every human being on the planet. Because until we heal ourselves as a species, we will never heal the planet. So to me, it's, you know, if you ask, how do you do climate healing? It's, it's the oxygen mask rule, right? So you have to put on your own oxygen mask first before you ask others to put, uh, before you help others to put theirs on. And so this to me is the oxygen mask rule. We have to heal ourselves first. And that begins by um, eating healthy food and having a healthy climate, I mean, healthy planet around us. So start cleaning up the mess that we have, we, we have created, okay? Uh, fourth is we need a new constitution, new way of organizing ourselves. And because we, are, we, sh we don't have to be divided into nations and fight, uh, fight nation against nation. And, you know, <laughs> to me, the, what is happening in Ukraine is like so, it's like 19th century or 20th century stuff. So it's 19th century thinking and 20th century processes to solve 21st century problems, right? It's, Beautifully said. Yeah. So it doesn't make any sense. We need to stop that. And it's a distraction because all the resources are being funneled over there and people are going hungry elsewhere. Absolutely. Uh, the World Food Program said, oh, we are, we are stealing from the hungry to feed the starving. So that doesn't make any sense. So uh, we need a new constitution and we need to probably organize around ecosystems and not around national boundaries, you know, because... The whole identity of nations, etc., with borders and things like that doesn't make any sense when everyone is fed properly. Everyone has good shelter available. To them. So if we truly meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we have, we have to tear down our borders. We don't need to have borders anymore. And so the true borders are really the ecosystems of the planet, the natural borders. Okay? Because we are all going to be focusing on how to make that ecosystem thrive each one of us. So this is why I say there's a, there is a need for us to have a global conversation around how do we organize ourselves as a species. And uh, fifth is a um, we have to work on a new game, a new economic game. Mm -hmm. The current economic game is all about uh, extracting from the bottom and funneling it to the top. Right? So we need a new economic game in which we stay within the bounds of the planet. So this is the donut economics of Kate Raworth. So you have to create processes and uh, rules of the game which have to be set in place so that everyone reads their ordinary lives and we automatically stay within the donut. So everyone is outside the hole and within the total bounds of the planet. Right, mm -hmm. And so that's a different game not the game we are playing now. And so uh, that we need to design, you know, and, and we are working on it. We know, you know, some of the parameters, how do you do this as a system? How would you create a system like this? What kind of rules do you have to put in place for that? And so it may require us to create subsidies from the, from the ground up, you know, to transition from the old game to the new game. So we are working on that as well. So that's the fifth one. And the sixth one is a common spiritual initiative because we all come together around this idea that there is a larger force 
that is guiding us. Okay? You may call the larger force by different names. It, it doesn't matter. We are all, we all need to come together and understand our commonality as a species. We are one family. We were one family in Africa. We spread throughout the world. And now we have to become one family again. And um, so, so it's that's the um, the interfaith vegan coalition is working on that. Yeah. And so, lastly, it is and, and not least, of course, is to a, a new ecology, an open source ecology, where we uh, bring back the the diversity and the richness of the planet, because we have been destroying the diversity. We have been trying to convert everything into monocultures so far. And so we need to reverse that. So those are the seven strategic Oof. actions. That's a, that's a, <laughs> that's, that's a heavy one. I, I, I'm kind of stuck on two things that I want to ask you because they were all piled into that, but uh, carnism and colonialism 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, extracting, like you said, extracting the world's the wealth of the forest, the wealth of the world, um, mm. and turning it into cash. Uh, right. What are your thoughts on these, on these, you say these four companies, uh, Fidelity, Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street, how they basically run our entire ecological system, our legislative system. Uh, what are your thoughts on a carbon tax? And how yeah. So a carbon tax or something like that is, is about, um, uh, so we're trying to regulate the flow again from the same top to bottom. Okay, so you, have, so you have a top to bottom flow and it's all created in the form of loans, right? So uh, organically it is, it, it's everything is a debt in society. So, so the way we have created our currency system, now there is more debt then there is wealth, then hmm. there is cash, okay? So like I say that the um, the animal agriculture industry, for instance, gets about $570 billion in in uh, subsidies, direct subsidies from governments around the world every year. And in turn, it creates about 12 to $14 trillion worth of damage every year. So if you put that together, you know, year after year, I mean, all the wealth that we have is not enough to go and repair the damage that we have created. This is why I say it's a completely new way of organizing ourselves that needs to happen. Because we right now don't have uh, any incentive to go and clean up the ocean, to go and clean up the rivers, to go and you know do beach cleanup. These are all volunteer work that doesn't get paid in the current right. model, right? So unless you have a system that rewards that kind of activity, you're not going to achieve this. But could you so, argue, couldn't you argue that having a system that penalizes this kind of activity could thereby limit the, the progressive limit the rate damage. Yeah, at which, right. at which we're working? Right. It will, that's correct. It will limit the additional damage that you're causing to the environment, but it doesn't do anything about cleaning up the damage that we've Absolutely. already done. Absolutely. Yeah. That's true. So, but that's where the focus should be now, you know? So it's like, you know, when you're, when you're really hot, you want to cool very quickly <laughs> and then you can stabilize, right? True. So that's, so that's, that's why I say you need to reverse the thing, which is, which is like creating a bottom up currency flow as opposed to a top down currency flow. Okay. And that would uh, organically change that, you know, that will organically create the, the necessary incentives. So you can create a bottom up currency flow where people are incentivized to do those cleanup activities. Uh, and and so they get paid for that. You know, I mean, they get rewarded for that, right? Uh, and then then everyone, you know, as the currency flows up the hierarchy, everyone knows where it came from. Mm -hmm. They came, so they know who they are serving, and it's very clear, right? So uh, that is why I'm proposing that we need to really change the architecture of the system, not uh, not just tweak it. With the, with the few tax laws and things like that. That's fantastic. And as you said, and as we know, the biggest contributor to helping people make these changes is access to education and most mm -hmm. importantly, reliable and valid information. And, uh -huh. and in your position paper, and as you discussed, 
right before animal agriculture is the leading cause of climate change. You discuss how the UN FAO, and for those of you listening, that's the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organizations, the FAO, their estimate for the life cycles, greenhouse emissions of animal agriculture is approximately 14.5% of the global humane greenhouse gases, right? Um, however, you say that this is incorrect. Uh, and yeah. even Goodhall and Anha Anne Hanks had it, attributed the lower bound at 51%, you argue up to 87%. Now, right. A, what is the reason for this discrepancy? And B, for those individuals that don't know how to truly grasp how to deduce data, how to read scientific evidence, how do you help people distinguish which data or evidence holds significance? <laughs> Good question. You know, uh, as an engineer, I'm sort of trained to do that in a way. Uh, to to so it's it is a specialist training that needs to happen to understand where the biases are in the data, and to understand how to overcome those biases. Because as engineers, we are tasked with building things that actually work. And so, <laughs> if we go along with things that people made up, you know, it's it's not going right. to work. Whatever we build will not work. So this is the this is why the training I had as an engineer was so important for this work that I'm doing now. And so the even FAO, first of all, you notice that it is it's in bed with all the industries. Yes, okay. meat it's industry, got, fishing industry, industry, dairy, dairy industry. Yeah, they are all in yeah. bed with them. They're, they're like partners, partners at assessing the impact of livestock. So excuse me. So they are self-assessing themselves. <laughs> Okay. The self-reported measure is not, this is why we don't really depend on this so much in, in research science. It's because exactly. we understand the biases of self-reported measures. <laughs> right, exactly. So that's what the UNFAO did. And Goodland and Anhang uh, came up with a lower bound of 51%. Okay? And that's based on several factors that they added. They pointed out all the things that the FAO had omitted, and then they added... Uh, the 20 year time frame for methane, mm -hmm. which again, I would argue is, I mean, there are so many deceptions <laughs> that, I, that I can list, just like the four deceptions that Dr. McDougall has for nutrition science. I, there are four deceptions that I've identified in climate science. Right. So, and it's institutionalized deceptions, okay, in favor of the meat industry. And so, uh, if you take that into account, I mean, so Goodland and Hannah took that into account. They they took 20-year time frame for methane emissions. And then they also added uh, a version of the opportunity cost. They calculated it based on the breathing contribution of animals and other and another factor. So totally, they came up with 11.5 billion tons of CO2 for the opportunity cost of the land that's being used for animal agriculture. Because... 37% of the land is being used for animal agriculture and just for grazing the animals. And that land only stores 2% of the land carbon. And you say, wait a minute, you, because land has three times as much carbon as the atmosphere. That's right. Total, right? In total. So you would say, if we can raise that 2% to 20%, <laughs> that will literally reverse climate change. Okay? So you make that calculation and you say, why can't you raise it to 20%? It is land. It used to have forests. So we calculated, well, if we just bring back the forest, you know, how much can be sequestered? So we knew that it could be done, right? So then I looked at Goodland and Hung's 11.5 uh, gigatons of CO2 as the carbon opportunity cost. And I noticed that they were only counting the above ground vegetation. Okay, that's how much CO2 is sequestered in the above ground vegetation that the animals are eating every year. Okay. So that vegetation is already growing on that land every year, okay, above ground. Now, whatever is above ground, twice as much will be sequestered below ground if you leave it alone. <laughs> because there's twice as much CO2 stored in the soil and in the root systems as above ground vegetation in general. So the 11.5 gigatons became 34.5 gigatons in our calculation. Oh, wow. Just by looking at the fact that it was only above ground vegetation that Goodland and Anand were using. So that raised the lower bound to 87%. That's okay. phenomenal. It's a lower bound, meaning if we stopped animal agriculture, 
and if we magically removed all the animals okay from the planet the earth will sequester at least 87% of our annual emissions every year okay so then it becomes a easier problem to solve it's at least 87% and we could help it i mean right now it's already sequestering that if we just leave it alone okay but if we start helping by planting trees and you know bringing back the native ecosystems that used to be there or whatever our intervention that we could do with the intent of healing the planet not with the intent of extracting money from the planet okay then we would be doing the right thing and and that would that, I, then i think it'll it'll probably be even more and that doesn't even count uh, all the vegetation that we are currently burning in uh, pasture maintenance fires so there is so much co2 in, in that uh, that we are not that i haven't counted yet it doesn't count the damage that we are doing in the ocean by bottom trawling 4 billion acres of the ocean floor every year so who knows how much healing that could do if we stop bottom trawling the ocean i mean we already okay. look at the 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 impact it has on our coral systems and yeah uh, i think people can actually visually see it now and they are still choosing not to do it fast enough and it's as simple yeah, as going people, vegan <laughs> yeah right. but people are you know people have uh, we have inertia as a species and that actually is a strength for us as a species because it means that we coordinate our actions among billions of us unlike chimpanzees who cannot do more than you know maybe 50 100 right so so we have the ability to coordinate our actions among billions of us okay, based on our inertia but it what is a strength can also be a weakness when when we are doing the wrong thing that's right so it's about making that switch understanding that there is that we are falling off a cliff and therefore we need to switch and, but then how and do you we have done that too Yes, yeah. but you know like you say we're a species of motion, Newton's law of physics and object in motion will continue to stay in motion. I'm sorry both of my parents have PhDs yeah. in physics. Um so how do you then change the directionality of that? It's not about actually stopping the inertia, it's just changing direction. Right. Right. So this is why I I I have um, tremendous faith in the food healers initiative that we have started. Uh, basic idea there is give people healthy vegan food let them taste it and they will see that hey i could live like this is that all it takes to heal the planet why can't i do that too right so so it's about it's it's love right it's a love based approach as opposed to shaking our fingers in their faces and saying change um and i think that will work better uh, i think that will work better but we have to try it out okay I love that you choose empowerment over over empowerment and compassion, right? And we I always say my partner always says compassion starts on your plate. Um yeah. it's the easiest way to go. Um but let's kind of segue here because you in many of the pro vegan documentaries that you've taken a part of You've actually taken on the role of executive producer and for those non-Hollywood folks that is someone who gives us a big old check. Um obviously, but but what about your role in Jane Velez Mitchell's 2019 documentary Countdown to Year Zero? Why this documentary made your heel list? <laughs> Yeah, the the documentary by Jane Willis Mitchell was something that uh, I never even expected that to happen. Cuz she was just, you know, uh bringing a camera along on our trips and she was with you, she was taping us, I said, okay? And then uh and then the next thing I know, she has edited it all into a documentary <laughs> and submitting it to film festivals and is winning all these awards, you know. Uh so to me it succinctly captures what we are trying to do okay and it's sort of so it's it's a um it's a well done because jane is a great storyteller okay? and so she knows how to cut videos and edit them to make the story flow so it's a very engaging documentary uh, people get mesmerized by watching it 
and they realize that hey there is a solution out there that people that others are not telling us okay? and uh, it wakes people up you know people don't like being duped which is what uh, they are trying to kill us is also about you know or conspiracy is about or what the hell is about it's a, telling people look you're being duped and you don't have to be duped you can step out of it so it's like we are all being factory farmed but the the windows of the factory farm are actually open and you can step out of it you don't have chains on if you realize you don't have chains on most of the chains are in our minds okay so we have been mesmerized into thinking that we we have to go along with the way things are but we don't have to and that that there there is the power in those words and dr selishrao thank you thank you thank you so much for sharing your time and your insight and your knowledge with us and that wraps up this episode of Be Kind Connects with Dr. Silas Rao. And to learn more about Dr. Rao, his initiatives, and to access the science that forms his transformational practices, please check out www.climatehealers.org. And to learn more about the Vegan World 2026, sign up for the summit or volunteer as a vitally engaged guardian of animals and nature a.k.a. Vegan, at Vegan World 2026, please go to www.veganworld2026.org. That's veganworld2026.org. And last but not least, make sure to follow Dr. Rao on Instagram, his handle, surprise, at Vegan World 2026. And to watch this episode of VKind Connects, subscribe to our VKind Vibes YouTube channel. And to stay better connected with us and the greater vegan community, give us a follow on Instagram and download the Be Kind app today. In a world where cruelty is the main entree, Be Kind Studios is serving up a new kind of culinary challenge. In each episode of Peeled, contestants face off to be named hottest vegan chef or get peeled into the compost. Tune in summer of 2022 as we cook up compassion. This season, color is in and cruelty is out. No plants felt pain in the making of this video.